Hello everyone and welcome to Rumi Podcast episode number one. ای راست خیزه ناگهان، ای رحمتی منتها، ای آتشی افروخته در بیشه اندیشه ها. تدبیر صدرنگ افکنی، بر روم و بر زنگ افکنی، من در میان جنگ افکنی، فی استناع لا یورا. In this video series, I'm planning to examine Rumi's poetry, in particular his um, Divan Shams Tabrizi, which compared to Mathnavi is not translated into English that much. There, there are some works that translate and deal and examine uh, this, this magnum opus, but um, still, there is a lot going on in, uh, in the Divan, and um, because of the technicality of the language in Divan, it is not widely translated compared to Mathnavi. One of the reasons for this matter, I think, is uh, that in Mathnavi, Rumi is a teacher. He brings up his teacher self. He uses narratives, stories to teach something. But in Divan, he's not doing that. He is, but generally, when you look at the big picture, he is in love. He is, uh, as we say, intoxicated by the divine love. That we see that selfless Rumi in Divan Shamsa Tabrizi. Whereas in, in Mathnavi, he is, um, again, mostly, he is this educator Rumi that we see. There has been lots of work about Mathnavi. I will not be dealing with, with that beautiful book here. Here I will be doing uh, examinations upon Divan. Now, before we start examining this beautiful poem, or as we say, this Ghazal sonnet, could be translated into English, but we say Ghazal, and as far as the translations go, they also translate it as Ghazal. So, Before we start examining it, I need to clarify uh, Shams Tabrizi's role, which is central to Rumi's thought. So we have two Shams Tabrizi. Uh, the first one is the historic Shams, uh, the one that you see in Rumi's books, the one that comes and changes Rumi and uh, takes him from the scholar he was, throw him into the ocean of love and bringing to us the Rumi that we now remember. But when he leaves Rumi, or even in his poetry, when uh, Rumi is discussing Shams, he's not always discussing that historic Shams. He's uh, discussing that symbolic Shams at Abrizi. He is discussing what he calls a mirror of God, a mirror that gives an image of God, a mirror that shows a manifestation or an emanation of God to Rumi. So we've got to be very careful, especially these days, that some people are trying to satisfy their interests um, out of this, uh, out of this um, spiritual relationship. Rumi and Shams Tabrizi's were two great pillars in Islam, two great scholars and two great mystics. And um, they have walked through the boundaries of this religion and never setting a foot aside. So we've got to be... You know, I, I am I'm Iranian. When we start reading poetry, Persian poetry, especially mystical poetry, before we start reading those poems, we first go through the symbolism because Persian poetry is extremely symbolic. You got to learn what all those symbols mean. For instance, in, in, in Persian mystical poetry, wine means divine love, divine knowledge. There are many symbols. Like if you are familiar with Rumi's work or with mystic poets, like. Sheikh Mahmoud Shabestari, you see that they have, they, they are using highly symbolic language. And actually, Sheikh Mahmoud has discussed this openly in his famous Gorcha and Raz, or the Rose Garden of Mystery. And there is a part where he discusses the symbolism. He says what he means by candle, by love, by wine. So, As per any intellectual tradition, first you get to study the boundaries, the structure, the symbolism of that tradition before you delve into deep waters. But for some reason that I do not understand when it comes to Persian poetry, we get these superficial meanings um, so widely and so hastily that it's, we, we don't even recognize the Rumi that is being discussed these days. So. That being said, um, when in most cases, when Rumi is discussing Shams Tabrizi, he's not talking about Shams per se, the historic Shams. He's talking about that 
divine grace, that divine manifestation that opened to uh, Rumin, changing his life. There were many verses in, uh, in Mathnavi and also particularly in Divan that we, we cannot even uh, justify those verses based on historic Shams Tabrizi. So it is only in this divine manifestational emanationist uh, perspective that we can justify what he means by those. So in the first, in this poem, we're going to, we're going to be seeing both the historic Shams and the uh, symbolic Shams. In the first line, of the poem, he says, "A rast rise no kahan, ve rahmati vi montahan, ve autashi afruh te dar bishe andi shahan." First, let me give a, a rough translation. It goes like, "You are the sudden resurrection. You are an endless grace. You are like a fire in the woods of thought." But what does he mean by this? We could be saying that he is uh, referring to Shams that came to his life in a historic sense. Um, and he resurrected Rumi from his uh, the very neat scholarly life into that love intoxicated mad Rumi and mad I, I mean it in a technical sense that when he gets to be selfless when he gets to the level of uh, annihilation in the divine essence and what we call and when comes back in as the subsistence in God or Bata'i Billah. So he, he says to God or Shams, you are the uh, sudden resurrection. You came and changed my life entirely, my interpretation. You are an endless grace. You are now here in the second hemistage there could be two interpretations. One of the interpretations say um, I, I'm talking about uh, the hemistage that says you are the fire in the woods of thought. One of the interpretations um, famously claim that um, you, God, are like the fire of love that appeared burning through uh, all the unnecessary thoughts, thinking in a combative form or the discursive thinking in a logical positivism form that tries to prove everything through the rules of logic. Uh, another interpretation, uh, and my interpretation, uh, is that Rumi is saying, you, God, are like a fire that passes through the woods of thought, that passes through a jungle, the trees of which are our thoughts, and you are the fire. What does fire do to trees? It burns them. So what he's saying is that our thoughts are incapable of understanding your true essence. You pass through this, this, this jungle, you pass through the woods of our thoughts, burning them and rendering us incapable of understanding you. The second line says, امروز خندان آمدی، مفتاح زندان آمدی، بر موست مندان آمدی چون بخشش و فضل خدا. You, you, you come today smilingly, laughingly, and blossoming. You came as the person who unlocks the prison's door. We will get into it. You came to the poor like a divine grace. Now, here we could refer to uh, historic Shams. He's saying, look, you, you, you came today laughingly happily in the sense that you brought happiness with yourself and then you unlocked me through me from the from the existential prison that i was stuck in then he says bar most mandan amali chon fazl faz chon bakhshish o fazl khoda you came to the poor as the grace of god what kind of poor why is he referring to himself as a poor person well, the destitute in Persian mystical poetry has several levels, and one of the, one of the like apparent meanings is uh, the financial destitution that the mystics deliberately adopt as a way of challenge that nurtures your soul in your spiritual journey. A more technical meaning is existential destitute, in the sense that God in creation gives us everything, including our existence. So. Our, even our existence is not from ourselves. We are in need of him. We depend on him existentially. That's why we are said to be poor 
in comparison to their rich. Another sense could be that uh, in the spiritual journey, you need um, a leader, you need a spiritual guide. So you are in need, you are a poor, and the, the person that leader, spiritual uh, guide, is the person helping you in this process. So he refers to Shams as someone who does this leading, who does this spiritual walking to Rumi through and as a representative of God's grace. Then we have Khurshidra Hajib Toi, Umidra Vajib Toi, Matlab Toi, Talib Toi, Ham Muktada Ham Muntaha. You are the radiance of the brilliant sun. You are the emblem of hope. You are that which is wanted and the seeker. You are that which is sought and the seeker. You are the beginning. You are the end. Then we have در سینه ها برخواسته اندیشه را آراسته هم خیش حاجت خواسته هم خیش تنگ کرده روا is one of the most I think beautiful lines in the entire divan together with the first line I recited I love that line so at the first hemistage در سینه ها برخواسته اندیشه را آراسته it says that you appear in the chests you know in Islamic metaphysics uh, Islamic metaphysics is heart oriented the, the, the heart is the placeless place that in which uh, divine manifestations appear so he says you manifest yourself in, in our heart and you decorate our thoughts and if you pay attention this thought is different from the thought in the first line in the first line he was rejecting those thoughts saying that your fire does away with those thoughts but here he's admiring so this thought is the one that leads you to the real. So you are manifested in the hearts and you decorate our thoughts, guiding us, leading us towards reality. And this is a very elegant part. He says, you put the prayers in our heart and you answered those prayers. Everything there is, is you. You give us the prayers, you teach us how to pray. And then you bring us your grace of answering to those prayers. در سینه ها برخواسته اندیشه را آراسته هم خیش حاجت خواسته هم خیش تن کرده روا ای روح بخش بی بدم وی لذت علم و عمل باقی به هانست و دغل که این علت آمد آن روا You are a rivalrous, rivalless soul creator. You are the sweet taste of knowledge and action. And whatever there is other than you is just but a trick. And dealing with these tricks, dealing with these deceptions, deception would be a better translation. Dealing with these deceptions is a sickness that could only be cured with seeking you. Mazam dagal kajbin shode, ba bi kunah dar kin shode, gah maste hurul in shode, gah maste nanu shurba. What does he mean? He is saying that. From that deception, from the previous line, we have become two-eyed. We cannot uh, separate the truth, the real, from non-real. We cannot find our true path. We are so deceived by the extraneous worldly desires, trivial matters, that we have lost the sense of truth, the sense of reality. Out of this, we have got to be the enemy of the innocent. When someone is not guilty of anything because of this two-eyedness, because of the deception, we are, we, we, we are becoming their enemy. And when there is someone who is not thinking like us, we are taking them as our enemy. But when there is someone speaking the truth, we cannot even recognize that. We are even deceived by the hereafter. And by hereafter, he means in the sense that instead of wanting the real, instead of wanting the God in the hereafter and even in this world, we are deceiving ourselves. We are trading with God that I'm going to be this right action, this righteous action, and I'm going to be avoiding uh, the, 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 the wrong to go to your heaven, to be with your angels. Master in you are intoxicated. We are drunken by the angels, he says. And so we are sometimes deceived even with the trivial worldly things. So in Rumi's thought, 
um, worldly engagement in this sense is dangerous because it prevents us from the truth, it prevents us from reality. And even dangerous is trading with God. I'm going to be doing something, I'm going to be avoiding something so that you give me something. The underlying message here is that you, you should want God for God. That's one of the reasons uh, Rumi is playing a love game. So he's saying, look, I'm giving you everything, my existence, my happiness, my everything, and I want you. Other poems, he's also acknowledging this. For example, he has this famous poem saying, Acclaimed the gambler who has lost everything, and he has... He's left with nothing but with the desire to play one more time. So he's saying, look, I have lost my everything for you, and I would grant you everything. I just want you. That is the only thing I have. That is the desire that I have. In Sokrim, in Aqalro, in Nogalbi, in Nagalro, because Bahrinon or Aqalro, Chandin Nashoyer Mojaro. Is now comparing spirituality with these trivial uh, worldly matters. In Sokrbin, pay attention to, look to spiritual enjoyments, spiritual joys, and let go of unnecessary thoughts. In Nogalbin, Hel Nagalro, think, look at these sweets. Again, he's referring to spiritual joys, and let go of this person saying this and that. Because of this bread and food, that is, the worldly desires, it is not worth getting into heaty debates. He is disdaining philosophers in this sense. Not philosophy and reasoning per se, but the, um, those heated debates that get you nowhere. And he was, he, he, elsewhere, he also criticizes the theologians, the Mutakallim, uh, basically, whose approach was trying to prove things through debate, through argumentation. And he's criticizing this. He's saying, look, with reason alone, you cannot reach reality. But you've got to be very careful. He's not rejecting reason entirely. He is a practitioner of reason, but he's, he's criticizing, relying on reason and absolute sense that, say, these days logical positivists are relying on. You bring forth many arrangements, bring them through the white and black. A very important principle in Rumi's poetry is uh, the opposites. For him, um, the whole world is a combination of opposites, uh, as he's showing us in this, in this line. And he says to God, you bring about all these arrangements with the opposites, white and black, day and night, good or bad. And these, um, and these contrasting forces uh, are in fight with each other. And this is how the world is, uh, how the world becomes, how life becomes dynamic, how life is sustained. These opposite forces are at play to sustain their lives. And this is how life is continuing in this, uh, in this picture. Health is known through sickness. They is known through night. Good is known through evil. All the opposites for Rumi. But all these opposites for him are coming to unity when he reaches the divine, um, the divine oneness, divine unity. So, he says to God, you set this fight so elegantly and without us seeing it. Now he's directly referencing God. He says, look, you, through the difficulties, through ascetic practices, you are training our souls, you are training ourselves. But you, you, you do this through your tools, through others, those tools being humans, animals, all, all the created beings. You are training us in our lives, you put us into difficulties through your, say, minions in my translation. But our souls, ourselves, are begging God to, to, to free them from this 
fight of the opposites from these unnecessarily worldly desires and the worldly prison. Then pointing to these, he says, all these are but deceptions and play. Then he tells himself, خاموش که بس مستعجلم رفتم سوی پای علم کاغذ بینه بشکن قلم ساقی در آمد از سلام Be silent to himself I am in need I am in need of the beloved I am going towards him Then he again tells himself to put away the paper break the pen the beloved came after going through all these steps after begging God for such a long time the divine manifestations appear in his heart and out of that joy he says put away the paper break the pen i don't need this right now the beloved came the beloved appeared in my heart this is the time of union not the time of logical formulation i hope you enjoyed this uh this bazal this is one of my favorite ones this is literally the first bazal in uh, divana shamsa tabrizi until our next meeting, our next episode, be well, be happy, and um, please like and share to help the channel. Thank you very much for watching. I hope these enlightened words illuminate you.